Nothing triggers PC fanboys quite like saying, I like laptops. That's why Origin PC sent us two to take a look at here today that couldn't be any farther from each other on the spectrum of what they aim to be. So a huge thank you to Origin PC for sending us both of these units to take a look at. So we've got two very different laptops aimed at very different purposes and they really couldn't be any farther from each other on the spectrum. But on the surface, one just looks bigger than the other. But the reason for that is with the recent state of affairs in the world, the amount of distance learning that's happening, working from home, remote working, laptops are actually something that I'm glad I'm a huge enthusiast of because I think more and more people are starting to realize their relevance and their importance. Anyone right now that is having to work remote and has a, their, their big work system or whatever at their office that they can't even access right now and are trying to work on some old netbook or whatever that's just maybe RDCing into their... You, I, I feel for you guys. I live that life. I know what it's like. Usually this is back to school time right now where people are preparing to go back to high school or start high school, start college, or heck, even start new jobs. Summertime seems to be a big uptick in employment and all that sort of stuff. And although things are really kind of backwards this year, um, the amount of, if you just go shop for a laptop, it's just like when webcams and all that went out of stock and haven't really come back. Laptops were kind of the same thing. Those that waited got slim pickings. So that's why the emphasis of how fast laptops have gotten today and how efficient they've gotten has made this a very interesting time for those that might have otherwise just ignored laptops are now seeing their importance and their relevance. So Origin PC sent us two different units right here. This right here is the Eon 15-X. This has a full-sized AM4 socketed Ryzen 9 3950X CPU. Obviously that's the highest end CPU you could possibly put in this socket, true for desktop as well, because it is a desktop socket with a full-on desktop CPU. We'll open it up later and we'll take a look at that mechanism. Uh, it does have a full-size 2070 uh, graphics card in there as well, uh, RTX card from Nvidia. So it is a soldered on die. That part is not replaceable like, this, like the CPU is. Um, but it's not a Max-Q or any of the additional like more efficient cut down versions. That's why this guy is so thick because it has obviously got to have a cooling solution that's capable of ham uh, handling the amount of heat and power draw, but also small enough and light enough to travel with, have it not be breaking your back and truly feel like a desktop replacement. Now over here, you have the much more traditional Evo 15. This is a successor to a laptop we took a look at a couple of years ago, which at that time was the fastest Intel-based laptop that you could get. This Evo 15 comes equipped with an Intel 10875H 10th gen 8-core 16-thread CPU. Let that sink in for a minute. Yes, this is 16-core 32-thread. However, it was only a couple of years ago when we were being sort of told that Intel CPU's four core eight thread was kind of as far as they could go on mainstream dies. Well, not only did we surpass that obviously with the 8700K with the six core 12 thread and then the 9900K eight core 16 thread, the 10875H is a laptop variant of the eight core 16 thread CPU. But in terms of graphics card, this has an RTX card in it as well. It is a 2080 Super Max-Q. That is quite literally, and I think Windows is updating on both these machines because they both just started turning on the fans. <laughs> but moving forward, we've been testing these all day, so there's some heat soak in there already. When it comes to the performance of this guy right here though, that is about as high as an Intel CPU that you can cram into a laptop and as fast as a GPU as you can get in there as well, all while maintaining this form factor. It's an all aluminum uh, unibody got a 4K OLED screen. Yeah, you heard that right. It's a 4K OLED, 4K, 4K OLED color calibrated panel. It's 60 Hertz. So for those diehard gamers, you may not be entirely happy with that 60 Hertz numbers. If you're anyone that's doing any sort of video editing, multimedia consumption, um, or you just care honestly about how amazing OLEDs look, this gives you that. Now it is configurable with other high refresh rate panels. You can get 144 Hertz full HD or even a 240 Hertz. And you can, you can find all those configurations down in the uh, comment box or the description box. You'll find a link to the website where you can configure these. Much more configurable though is the AMD system when it comes to CPU options. Whereas the Evo 15 only comes with the 10875H at least at the time of making this video. So the concept here in today's video as we move forward is not gonna be which is better. Because we already know, anything CPU-wise, this guy wins. Hands down, no point in even entering the ring. 
twice as many cores, twice as many threads as this guy over here. It's also got the cooling capacity of handling all of those workloads without doing major throttling. Although it is worth mentioning the 3950X in here is sort of locked to the eco mode, which is a, a function that's actually native to Ryzen and other motherboards. Regardless, the CPU in a desktop variant would pull more power than the laptop's gonna allow it to do. Therefore, it's artificially limited at eco mode to make sure that it doesn't pull too much power from its power delivery system. Which, by the way, look at this power brick. I mean, it's not the smallest power brick on there, but I know there's someone watching this right now with their gaming laptop and it's got a brick the size of the original Xbox One brick, or even the original Xbox brick. This is a 230 watt brick with a 62 watt hour battery in here. It could be a bigger battery in there, um, but we'll talk about the batteries in a, in a minute when we take it apart. Now the Intel on the other hand, look at this. That's a 180 watt brick. I guess the best comparison is, <laughs> this is an iPhone 11 Pro something or another. As you can see, it is like literally the exact same size as the brick itself and the brick is about twice as thick. Now, obviously, because it's a 180 watt power delivery, it's a bigger battery on the smaller computer, which is kind of interesting. When it comes to the outsides of the laptops, they're pretty basic. Both of them have headphone jack and microphone jack, of course. The Intel does have a Thunderbolt on the back, as well as a mini display port and full-size HDMI. The AMD system has a USB-C on the back with HDMI and mini display port. And then on the sides, you have your typical USB 3.0s. Both of these actually feature, though, full-size RJ45 jacks, which as someone who traveled a lot, like I said a million times in this video, and you're gonna hear it a bunch more, I just always liked having the option to plug in when available, especially if I went to hotels that had really bad wireless. And some of those hotels actually had RJ45 plugs on the desk with a little retraction wheel. And although the speeds were still atrocious, I didn't have to deal with dropout when you were physically wired up. Now, although you could use some sort of a dongle with either USB-C or Thunderbolt to have an RJ45 jack added, you don't have to because they're native on these systems. Um, both of these feature very similar uh, intake and exhaust designs where they intake from the bottom and exhaust out basically the three sides. Same is true for the Intel. And if we look at the bottom, you can see plenty of ventilation and you can kind of get a glimpse of the heat pipe solution that's inside the, uh, the Eon 15X. We'll be taking a look at that. Again, we'll be doing a teardown after we do some performance tests here. That way we can uh, not skew our results. We don't want to take it apart, reapply thermal paste and stuff. And then our results won't be out of the box. And when it comes to the Intel system, you can see it's also a lot of ventilation on the bottom because cooling is key with these. Fun fact though, the AMD system actually comes with two tubes of thermal paste. Removable desktop CPUs has been done before in the past, but what's happened is the improvements of efficiency and cooling and power necessity has improved so much over the last, let's say about 10 years since the last full-size desktop CPU laptop I had personally, um, it's all gotten so much better that you can actually get away with it now with a very realistic cooling solution. We'll have to have any sort of docking water cooling station or crazy amount of cooling built into it. This is, this is actually what an average laptop just a few years would have looked like in terms of size and, and girth, if you will. All right, let's go ahead and uh, start doing some testing here. So after a quick wardrobe change, four or five days later, we've had a better part of a week now playing with these laptops. That's why they're filthy. We've touched the screens, we've got skin oils and stuff on them because we've been using them. I don't know what Phil's been doing with them after hours, but I know Phil has plucked around on here. We've done temperature testing, we've done heat soak testing, we played around with power profiles. We've done a lot of things with this because we're trying to discover here what the proper best use case is for each of these form factors. And that's really what the point of this video is, which we already discussed the desktop replacement versus the thin and light. 
It really is exciting though. Whether you're into laptops or not, it's exciting because showing the amount of performance that you can get now in something this small is something that was not achievable until this generation, obviously. Since RTX cards have come out, the amount of cram tensor and uh, CUDA cores and uh, RT cores, as well as the amount of CPU architecture that you can cram into these now, uh, eight core, 16 thread, 16 core, 32 thread, just makes them absolute beasts at anything that they do. So let's go ahead and start with a discussion of gaming. Uh, one thing to point out, you might have noticed on those charts, is the resolution of the Intel system is a little bit different than the resolution of the AMD system. We're not too sure why it is, but instead of 1920 by 1080, we're getting 1920 by 1200. Instead of 2560 by 1440, we're getting 2560 by 1600, which are 16 by 10 aspect ratios, but this is a 16 by 9 panel. It does have a native 4K resolution of uh, 3840 by 2160. So that's a 16 by nine. So we think that maybe uh, Windows might be somehow displaying the wrong resolutions. We don't know how, we'll look into that a little bit later. So I just wanted to point out, this should not be considered versus this when we show, showed you those charts. It really should be looked at as this versus this at a 1920 resolution versus a 2560 resolution. And then this is only 1080p because it's a 1080p panel. And Needless to say, it's a beast. In fact, the 2070 in here seems like a pretty good pairing with the AMD because it's a 1080p panel. Um, we mentioned that it's a full-blown 2070. Now, back in the day, having a mobile version um, would mean that there was a same name but less cores. That's not the case with the 2070. But one of the things that they have to kind of stay within is power specs. And because you're running off a 230-watt power brick, um, and you obviously get to power a 16-core, 32-thread CPU, you have a reduction in core clocks and there's no overclocking available to it on here. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But obviously the titles that we chose for those benchmarks, um, Far Cry 5 doesn't use DLSS, it doesn't use ray tracing, but it's, a, it's a, a title that we like to use for our testing because it is CPU intensive. Even the tracked benchmark does actually have a fair amount of physics that it has to do. So it uses your CPU and GPU at the same time. So it was kind of fun to compare these two in terms of average FPS. And funny thing is that there were only one FPS different at the um, 1080p equivalent. Although it is important to note that there is a couple of extra, there's a few extra percentage of pixels that the Intel system's having to render versus 1080p, 1200 versus 1080. You do that number, you do the math, you can figure out exactly how many more pixels it is. Um, but with uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, that is a DLSS title. So it's using the tensor cores for the anti-aliasing. And then it is also a ray traced shadows. So it's not using ray tracing for lighting, but it's using ray tracing specifically for shadow uh, quality. And that's a pretty big performance hit. When I do this testing, I will always show max settings. So the ray traced shadows was set to ultra and everything else was set to the highest settings possible. And the reason why I do that is to show you what the worst possible solution or outcome is in terms of gaming performance. If you were to go in there and reduce the quality of the shadows even down to like medium, you would get double digit improvements in FPS. Uh, it would sit actually closer to 60 or 70 FPS. And if you turned it off entirely, you'd get actually get 90 FPS, but you could still take advantage of DLSS. Now that type of gaming performance on a laptop is not something that you could have even with previous generation. I mean, even right now, any of the 20 series GPUs that are available in laptops from the 2060 and up is gonna be faster than the uh, Pascal variant of the same tier. But the amount of CPU performance you get with it. Now in terms of, uh, and then of course we, we did 3 Mark and we included Port Royal, which is specifically a ray tracing uh, benchmark. So you could see how the 2070 full size versus the 2080 Super Max Q compares. Obviously the 2080 Super Max Q was faster at pure ray tracing performance. But that's only part of the story with these laptops. What about CPU performance? So as you saw with Geekbench, the multi-threaded the multi performance of the AMD did exactly what you expected to do. It Hulk smashed the Intel variant. However, if you take a look at the single core performance, Intel did exactly what you'd expect it to do. It, mm, I don't know, not quite Hulk smashed, but it definitely maybe backhand slapped the AMD at single core performance. Most titles these days are taking advantage of multiple cores. Um, bursty workloads would be a little bit more beneficial on the Intel because it is going up to about 4.9 gigahertz on those cores, 4.8, 4.9. Um, but Premiere is one of those ones that's pretty interesting as well. In terms of workload, um, the NVEC encoder is something that both of these systems could take advantage of. Now, the NVEC encoder you're starting to see be way more utilized in stuff like OBS, Premiere finally launched a, a, a version that uses the NVEC encoder with the latest drivers and latest Windows uh, version. And if you're doing anything that uses any sort of extreme multitasking workload, 
the AMD system is just going to be your obvious go-to choice. They call it a desktop replacement for a reason. They're desktop parts that are shoved into this case. And I think that that's pretty evident. The Intel system here, when we went into this testing, kind of expected it to get pushed around. But believe it or not, it did a pretty good job at holding its own, even when it comes to Premiere uh, rendering. And the reason for that is because it's an Intel-based system, when you enable the NVEC encoder in it, not only does it use the NVEC G or the GPU, it uses the Intel in iGPU as well to be a part of the video processing. So you have three things doing something in terms of video rendering. And that's something that unfortunately the AMD system isn't able to take advantage of. But what AMD does offer you is brute force. So it's two very different methods. This is sort of like, this is like a samurai with very placed precision cuts. This is like, there's two things I want to talk about here before we wrap this up, and that's going to be obviously thermals and acoustic, which is tied together, and then the displays. The Intel system is available in several different displays. This is obviously the OLED 4K, which is only available with the 2080 Super. Um, you also have a 240 hertz gaming uh, full HD or 1080p panel available, I believe, also with the 280, uh, 2080 Super. And then you do have a, a couple of other variants in there as well. I personally, would have preferred the 240 hertz panel. Because one of the things with the OLED panel is glare. In fact, if I move this panel a little bit, you can see our lights right there are being reflected. And that's a personal preference of mine. However, the 240 hertz panels and the FHD panels are not gonna get you the level of color accuracy as you get with this panel, which would make this obviously very good for any content creation. Um, colors on gaming pop. But for me, I'm more of a, of a refresh rate snob than I am over color accuracy snob on something I'm doing games and stuff with. So if I were looking at this unit specifically for gaming and such, I would want the higher refresh rate panel. Uh, but the nice thing is that that is configurable. The AMD system over here being the 144 hertz panel paired with a 2070 does seem like a little bit of an odd pairing. However, both of these panels are calibrated. They are color calibrated. So you are gonna be able to get pretty dang close in any of your content creation, photo editing, um, anything else that needs color. And either of these are gonna be pretty good choices um, when it comes to that particular need. Now acoustics, they're small form factor PCs, laptop, desktop replacement. And when you put them under extreme load, they're gonna make noise. That is the nature of the beast. The amount of cooling and ventilation in here is pretty impressive. In fact, we did a teardown of both of these units. And the Intel laptop is pretty traditional. It's exactly what you would expect. Shared heat pipes going over the CPU and the GPU, very thin, you've got a blower style cooler that's pulling air in through the bottom and exhausting it multiple directions out the side. When it comes to the AMD system, it's basically the same thing, just way, way beefier. But with even though it's a desktop CPU, the amount of heat pipes and such in here and the amount of fans and the RPMs are definitely able to keep the temperatures under check. It's warmer than you would wanna see in your desktop. I mean, we, could, we saw this chip go as hot as 91 degrees. Now, I know that sounds incredibly warm, however, 95 degrees is where you start getting hard thermal throttling. But this is also a part that's been reduced down to 65 watts because of the power delivery, which, which we've already explained. The amount of performance that you can get out of this 3950X at 65 watts is just nothing short of amazing, regardless of your Intel or AMD fanboy. In fact, it's faster than the 3900X desktop uh, processor that we have on an AIO with water. So let that sink in for a second. If you're watching this video right now and you've got a beautifully water-cooled 3900X, this is faster. The last thing to talk about here obviously is expandability. Um, that's another thing I just included in the teardown here. Both of these do have expandable storage. They do have replaceable memory, a uh, SODIMM. They're not soldered in or anything weird like that. The Intel system, however, does not have room for a two and a half inch uh, drive, which the AMD system does. In fact, the AMD system has room for two M.2 NVMEs, a, a changeable CPU, as well as the two and a half inch drive. And then the Intel system, very traditional, two NVMe SSDs, and then obviously swappable so dim just like the AMD. So there has been our look at these two units from Origin PC. So once again, a huge thank you for Origin to, for sending us both of these units to take a look at. The Evo 15, the successor to a laptop we took a look at a couple of years ago, um, which I think I said in the start of this video, my business manager is still using to this day. Um, although that one's on a Pascal, so I'm sure he's gonna be like, hey Jay, what are you gonna be doing with that laptop? It's probably time for an upgrade, and I'm gonna be like, you son of a And then the Eon uh, 15X, which is 
eons ahead of any other laptop uh, that you could possibly get that needs anything CPU related. So my question to you is, and Phil and I had a very hard time kind of answering this question for ourselves because they're, they're both so powerful. Which one is for you and how would you use it? If you had a laptop with 32 logical cores, what would you do with it? Would you, would, you, would you set it up? Would you put VMs on it? Would you set it up as some sort of a server? What mobile workload do you possibly, could you possibly do to utilize that many cores? Two Chrome tabs. Two, cro two Chrome tabs. And then if you had the Intel system, what would you do with it? And which panel would you go with? In fact, to answer those questions and know how they're spec'd, you guys should go down in the description below. You can find links to the landing page for these laptops, and then you can see the different specs and pricing available, because that's constantly changing, and specs are probably changing too. Um, that'll tell you everything you need to know in regards of availability, pricing, and all that sort of stuff. So again, huge thank you to Origin PC for sponsoring today's video. You guys have your homework now. Comment down below and let us know how you would use these systems.